Good morning and welcome to the session on data science for socioeconomic shocks. Uh, my name is Aurio de Paula and I'm professor of economics at uh, UCL. I'll be moderating this event, which will have two superb presentations by Luisa Nolan, who's chief data scientist at the ONS, the Office for National Statistics, then Vasco Carvalho, who is a professor of macroeconomics at Cambridge, and then a panel discussion uh, where we'll be joined by the also superb Karen Croxon, who's Deputy Chief Economist and Head of Social Data Science at the Financial Conduct Authority. Um, you're not here to listen to me, so perhaps we can now kick off the event with Luisa's presentation. Thank you, and good morning. It's really good to be here, even if it's only um, virtually. I'm looking forward to Vasco's talk and the panel sessions afterwards. But first, I wanted to talk to you about some of what we in ONS have been doing to respond to the um, pandemic and particularly about what we've learned about how to respond. And it seems <clears throat> particularly appropriate one year after the first lockdown kicked off. So I want to talk broadly about three things. Firstly, about the data, because as one of our senior data scientists in the data science campus once said, if you don't have the data, you can't science it. Um, and then about collaboration, which is another important ingredient for doing data science. And then I've just got a couple of examples about what we've been doing in the field of data science. Um, this is really just the tip of the iceberg of all the work that ONS has been doing then. So right back a year ago, we were asked two really big questions. First of all, what's happening? Are the restrictions working? And secondly, what's the impact on the economy? And actually there was a third question as well, which was, can we have it now? And can we have it with one day's um, latency? So the search was on the high frequency, low latency data to answer this question. Um, the monthly um, frequency of our regular outputs not really cutting it in a time of rapid change. The first thing that we looked at, um, <clears throat> Google published their Google mobility reports. Initially, they published them as PDFs, which was not entirely useful. So one of the first things that our team did was to turn those PDFs into CSVs within 48 hours after, the, uh, after Google published them and made them available across the world. These were really useful because they were high frequency and low latency. We could do international comparisons with them, see what was happening in other countries as well. And there was regional data too. And of course, where the campus goes, Google follows. So not long afterwards, they were publishing them as CSVs as well. Each mobility data set comes, big data set comes with its own um, biases and uh, advantages. So we've looked at a number of different data sets. We've been working with WorldPop in Southampton University to look at Facebook mobility. So here's something we published just last week, um, looking not just at the number of people moving, um, but also the flows between local authorities. We've also worked with telecoms data, which has had some really interesting things around um, shielding vulnerable groups and whether people are moving outside of their local area. All of the data that we've had so far has been aggregated and anonymized before it reaches us, because even in the middle of the pandemic, we want to be really careful about the ethics of what we're doing. So this is interesting. It was really useful data, daily data with a day's lag. Um, super useful for decision making, but of course it doesn't tell you everything. Um, it doesn't tell you about some of those more detailed behaviours. Are people staying um, at least two metres away from each other? Are people wearing face masks? Are they complying with self-isolation? So in addition to these new big data sources, ONS stood up some new questions in the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey asking some of those things. And I think this reflects the need for multiple data sources not just big data is extremely useful, but not just that, also looking at our more traditional uh, um, processes. But it's difficult surveys. We've had decades and decades to understand the biases and uncertainties in them and understanding those in these new data sets and making sure we're clear about the caveats about what we're seeing and what we're not seeing has been really important. But there's no doubt that this has been really interesting and important. And with the mobility data, I think also one of the things we've learned is that this has been a new data source for us, and I think it has um, use outside COVID for things like looking at real-time populations, migration, tourism, and so on. 
One of the other questions was about the economy. A big part of the economy is consumer spending. So we've been working with the financial sector. This is also something we published last week um, based on data from Revolut, which is a challenger bank, looking at how spending has changed over the last year. And you can see the gray parts are where the lockdowns are. Um, shows a surprising resilience once the first lockdown was, was over to spending. Um, we like buying stuff, I think, in the UK. But again, thinking about that bias in the customer base, thinking about different classifications, thinking about some of the um, geographical issues in order to be able to interpret this sensibly. But it's really clear that without this data, it would have been difficult to get a picture of what's going on. And as I said, I think there's a taste for this faster data now. Um, it's interesting when we talk about quality, normally we talk about accuracy, but I think this has reinforced the idea that there's actually six dimensions of quality and timeliness is really important as well. So the next part is around collaboration. Who do we need to work with? Who's got the data? Who's got the skills? Who's got the knowledge? Um, talked a bit about working with the private sector, which has been interesting because as well as the um, making sure that we uh, apply disclosure control and you can't identify individuals, we've also had to work within some of the commercial sensitivities as well. So that's been a big learning experience for us. Um, but also we've been working with the academic sector. So one of the things when you're doing new work and it's urgent and fast and there are big decisions being made on it, really important to make sure you get independent and review, review and challenge for that work. And that's something that we've called on the academic sector quite a lot for. Um, and the last part really for this is about how we can collaborate securely. What you really want is the people with the skills and knowledge and the data in a place, in an environment with the right tools. So I want to just share this with you, which we spun up. So we were working closely with the Joint Biosecurity um, Centre. Some data sets only we had access to for various different reasons, some we could share. So we, and we wanted to use uh, scalable big data, data science tools in a secure way. So we've spun up this uh, Google Cloud environment, security first, secure to official sensitive, so we can analyze our secure data on there. Um, permissions based, so there's a space where once it's passed all the approvals and it's safe to share, we can share with JBC and they can uh, explore the data themselves um, and analyze this. And I think one of the things that I really like about this is not only did we spin this up for this specific purpose, but it's infrastructure as code. So we now have a template and we've actually spun up two, at least two other instances of this as well. It's been hugely successful. So we're making progress to getting all those things in the right place. So what about the data science? Once you have the data, um, we want to do something with it. We want more information faster and we want to be able to monitor and interpret what's going on. So I've got a few quick examples of what we've been doing at ONS in this space. So as well as spending vacancies is an important indicator of the um, economy. We've been working with Adzuna, um, looking at their advertised vacancies. Over a hundred million job adverts. So it's, this game is quite a big data set. Um, and using neural networks here to assign the categories based on the job adverts. And you can see, so the blue line represents um, last year and the dark blue line represents the year before you can see that the pandemic had quite a big impact on vacancies. This data is published every week as part of our um, uh, enhanced and expanded faster indicators um, publication at ONS. Again, this is not a measure of vacancies in the sense that the vacancy survey would be, but it's a really useful indicator of what's happening, um, who's suffering, who's recovering. Um, in a timely way. Again, really around mobility and, and crowding, we had publicly available stream traffic camera images and turned these into time series showing busyness um, in town centres. Um, so this, this was uh, uh, using convolutional neural networks to identify the different types of vehicles or whether something was a human. You can see from the pictures that you can't actually identify people here. That's, that's not what the um, purpose of this was. 
to put together time series about how busy things are in, time in, in town centres. Again, this is part of our um, part of our faster indicators publication. But what we haven't done is something like uh, looking at whether people are wearing face masks. There's huge ethical issues with that, as well as um, technical issues with identifying that. And it's really difficult to look at something like are people really social distancing? I think even if you could do it with this data, it would be difficult to say that it was representational anyway, because of the positioning of these cameras. So there are technical, ethical and interpretation challenges with these new data sets. And my last example is we have surveys, we quickly stood up the business impact of COVID-19 survey, so known as BICS. And that showed that around initially one in four businesses had temporarily stopped trading. But when you send out a survey, you don't know whether people are not responding because they haven't had time to, and it's a genuine non-response, or they're not responding because they don't exist anymore. And this was a particular problem at the beginning of the um, at the beginning of the pandemic when people were sent home and weren't in work to be able to answer those questionnaires. So we worked with Glass AI, um, a small startup who read over half a million business websites um, off the internet and we searched for COVID notices on those websites, so using keywords, and then looked at how many of those businesses used their websites for COVID-19 communications. We linked them to the business register Although there were a lot of uh, businesses in the sample, by the time we linked it and identified the um, COVID notices, it was a much smaller sample. So it didn't quite do what we wanted it to do, but it was really important to explore this and to explore all of these things. Innovation is important, even where it doesn't work out how you expect it. And again, I think what we learned from this is that even though perhaps it wasn't the answer to the question around COVID, there's a lot of useful information here and there are other uses that we might want to put this data to in the future. So what have we learned? This is a very small selection of some of the work that's been done at ONS and I think the first thing I personally have learned is how proud I am of all of my ONS colleagues who've been working flat out to answer some of these really challenging things, standing up things like BICS, um, expanding the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey, the massive COVID infection survey um, in very short time scale have done an absolutely brilliant job. We know that there's an appetite for faster information and we need to think about that balance between timeliness versus accuracy and of course the other dimensions of quality as well. We probably need both um, but I don't think this appetite is going to go away even as hopefully the pandemic dies back. Collaboration is really important. There aren't any um, there aren't any unicorns and being able to bring people together to access data securely and work on it, bring all those different things like the data science skills, the data subject matter skills is really important. Plus that um, independent review so that whatever we do, we can feed into the decision making quickly. Already said we need the right tools and skills and environment. Novel data sources give us new insights, although there are new things to tackle like um, commercial sensitivity, um, there's a rich source of data in the private sector, and I think we're just beginning to really understand what that, that can do for us. There's still more work to do to understand it properly, to understand bias and uncertainty in some of those data sets, but I hope that this has given us, um, uh, I don't know, an injection into uh, using more big data um, to better understand what's going on. Because these data sets are new, because you're working at speed, because these decisions are really important, life-changing decisions. The quality, the caveats around the data and the data science are really important and communicating those to non-analysts at speed is really important as well and I think that's where that collaboration, review, checking the messages are getting across is really important. So finally, how can we prepare for the future? What would we do that would be better for next time? Hopefully there isn't the next time. Keep exploring new data sources. Um, keep finding out what we can do, what we can learn. I think there's an interesting field here around data fusion. So taking the best of big data, which may be granular, fast, but dirty, and how we fuse that with statistical data, which is rigorous, but sometimes slower. Understanding complex relationships 
Um, so not kind of siloed time series, but understanding the interactions between those things like simulations, digital twins is, is um, getting more traction at the moment. Um, and, and not just reporting on a single thing, but looking at how those different things interact with each other. I think there's more value to be got from synthetic data and federated data approaches, which helps democratize data, open it up to more people to explore. And I think also we need to bear in mind a crisis needs a rapid response. If we have things in place already, it's easier to do that. But to develop these complex models, particularly around the relationships, takes a longer time and we need to plan ahead. And the very last thing I'd like to say is that it's really important to innovate, not to be afraid to fail. We learn something when we fail. If we haven't done it, we're not pushing ourselves enough. Thank you. I'll hand back to Arya. Thank you, Louisa. This was a very interesting presentation on, on certainly very important work that the ONS is doing. It's really, really interesting to see that. I'll now hand over to Vasco, who is going to give us a second presentation on the theme for this event. Vasco, the floor is yours. Thank you much, Ario. Thanks very much for the invitation. And thank you, Louisa, and thank you to the ONS. Just, I'll have a quip at some point to the ONS. Uh, so I just want to say that um, I actually feel that uh, we're very lucky to live in a country that has the ONS responding in real time and in high resolution. So without further ado, I guess what I wanted to do here is two things. One is kind of try to convey a sense in, in what, what economics has, they, has done and how that signals a change in how economics in particular macroeconomics has done uh, in the COVID crisis, okay? So the first thing I want you to, so, and there's like two takeaway points. One is kind of a broader picture of really understanding the world we live in now and particularly COVID as a watershed moment in terms of the availability of data to think about the economy, to provide restrictions on the way we think about the economy. And second, I'll take you through a couple of examples of what has been done, right? So the first thing I wanna tell you um, is, is actually a very nerdy, but very interesting story. So some point in the seventies in Chile, um, they thought that, you know, where the world should go is as you see. A control room, this was kind of the, 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 the project that um, actually done by, the, in the UK by Stafford Beer, a, a great cybernetic uh, leader in management. And the idea was that you would have real-time data feeds from all the factories in Chile, you would have uh, essentially what would uh, the, the designing an agent-based simulation going on in real time with the data feeds. And you would have policymakers, politicians and economists sitting around the room and in real time understanding the economy in real time, reacting, tweaking, uh, you know, responding to, to what they're seeing. Now, the reality of this in Chile was that there was you know, not even this, for example, relies on a, a network of telex and, you know, precursor to the internet that never got done. So none of this ever happened. And, and Chile has very particular reasons why that never happened, but this is more general in economics. So most of 20th century economics, uh, and you have to realize that uh, economics sometimes gets a bad rap, is based on very small data. So uh, one of the things that maybe rules your life, which is interest rates you pay in the mortgage, is based on an historical relation where coming from A.W. Phillips. Uh, so monetary policy is based a lot on the premise of a, of a trade-off between economic activity and inflation. That is typically done with a hundred data points. Okay. Now, economics has changed throughout the 20th century and has become more and more uh, empirically minded uh, for good reasons. But one, in particular, one area where this has been more difficult to do is the analysis of business cycles. Because if you want to understand recessions, you have, you have to understand that you have about 10 cyclical episodes in 50 years for the average country, which means that you're really you know, theorizing about 10 data points. So you have to understand that macroeconomics in particular is as hard, is as, hard as figuring out the Hubble's constant. You have two, three observations that are relevant. And that's why you see a lot of theory <laughs> and a lot of public discussion, right? And, and the situation has changed. I don't want to make COVID as a particular kind of discontinuity point that was never seen before. But there was a trend towards more data. But COVID has uh, seen, uh, has been a watershed moment. So 
so I want to focus in particular on, on kind of what's going on um, and, and kind of this move away, or at least a combination between what Louisa was saying about the slow moving census type information that aggregates to the macroeconomy. You know, the, the business cycles don't, don't exist in the abstract. They exist by aggregation of all the micro data into an aggregate GDP measure, for example. Um, but kind of, but it's slow moving and very costly to run census. Um, so I want to I want to go over some data sources and some analysis and what this has led both in terms of real time analysis and policy discussion. So the kind of the first big point here is the transformation of understanding recessions uh, from average relation average historical relations. The best you could do is average over ten or twenty points. Um, policy response with lags and policy evaluation with even further lags to real-time analysis and real-time policy discussion. So uh, Louise already told you, this. Is, so this is work we did in early April. This is already an update. Uh, so this, a lot of it is coming from transaction data. So what you have here is um, the aggregate of 2.1 billion transactions from the second large bank, largest bank in Spain um, and understanding, and by, by you know, late March, we were seeing this before people understood when everyone was scrambling for the first question that came up, which was how big is the slack? And that obviously motivates, you know, how big does how big does policy do policy packages have to be? Depend a lot at a first order on how big is the slack. And the slack was very large. So year on year in Spain, um, expenditure fell by about 60%. Right. And, and you even see what we what we call the toilet paper week here, where people started accumulating stuff just before the lockdown. But you also see um, what you see in these different vertical lines are basically gradual stages of, of easier, uh, laxer and laxer lockdowns. And then another big discussion in the policy circles worldwide was what is the shape of the recovery, which basically is important to know because it, it kind of how, how fast do we ease off? How fast do we remove support to the economy, right? And in fact, if you've been paying attention, the UK even now in the latest uh, monetary policy um, at the central bank, at the meetings at, this, at, 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 the, at the Bank of England, you, had, you saw some discussion about how fast is the economy recovering. And, uh, and so this is my quip. So this was like circulating in the nerdy internet, which was basically some monetary policy committee members kind of took a strong stance of, on kind of saying, you know, the economy is recovering very fast. And they were saying that very early. So this is a really a big change from what from previous recessions. And they were saying, based on graphs like this, we are seeing a very fast V-shaped recovery that is quickly getting back to normal as soon as we normalize the economy. Okay. Uh, and of course, as, as Luisa was saying, that really depends on on data sets that we really don't understand yet, and in particular don't understand fully their biases, and, you know, um, their representativity. Uh, so this, uh, I think, is going forward a big opportunity, but also a big, a big source of collaboration in the sense that these data sets are typically unstructured, uh, with labels missing. So there's, a, there's an entire machine learning arsenal of um, classification, labeling, uh, removing biases and understanding these data sets that we need to go forth. Um, but so this is kind of an aggregate picture, but we also got uh, kind of got moving into kind of real time policy evaluation. We all, the fact this data is not only real time, but it's also of high resolution. So I'm going to give you two examples. One is high granular re resolution across space. And for example, this is still in Spain, there were local variations in the lockdown policies, particularly as the economy eased. So we tried to understand what was the most costly measures and, uh, you know, and, and try and talking to, so you, the data is rich enough that you can do decent statistical analysis and understand uh, stage one, just for you to understand is basically a uh, shutdown of, uh, of some sectors, sorry. Stage two is those sectors that are shut down are allowed to open as long as the stores are not too big. And stage three is everything is open, but with varying capacity restrictions, very density restrictions. 
So we, we kind of were able to, to conclude from there that capacity restrictions are much less harmful. So you can kind of opening the door to policy design where, for example, you can um, not necessarily shut down a part of the economy and maintain the other part of the economy open, but perhaps um, optimal lockdown policies involving just lower, the lower capacity throughout the economy. And that may be better. So that is a discussion that is ongoing uh, in terms of optimal lockdowns, which this opens. Number two, that I, this is actually UK evidence now, uh, is talking about inequality in real time. Um, so what happened, and this is maybe particular to this crisis, this is coming from in now, in not, not from banking data, but from app data, in particular UK app data on money dashboard. Uh, and th what they were able to do is track uh, granularly, now not across space, but across the income distribution. So what you see there is that in this crisis, um, the highest contraction of expenditure has, has come in proportionate terms by in high income groups. But you also are able to kind of draw conclusions from the app and understanding that their earnings did not contract by the way. And the corollary of this is that the savings by the high income has increased disproportionately, which for which a second corollary is that coming out of this crisis, you will have more wealth inequality. Okay, so the, the people with, that already control most of the wealth are saving the most during the crisis. Um, and that again has uh, as profound policy and societal implications. Now let me, let me move on and tell you about something that Louisa was already saying, which is Okay, uh, there was this kind of explosion of mobility data. Can you combine these data sources into, into real-time policy evaluation? So this is uh, a paper by Timo Fetzer, where he was looking specifically at the, at, at the impact of the Eat Out, Help Out scheme. Now, he's not focusing on what were the economic gains of the Eat Out, Help Out scheme. What he's noticing is that Eat Out to Help Out, by design, increased mobility. So this is coming from Google mobility data. So this is year on year increase in mobility in retail and recreation. And as Louisa was telling you, you can resolve this at the local area. Right. So now you can combine this with data on the appearance of COVID clusters and exploit variation across space on the participation of restaurants uh, on the scheme. And the conclusion that CIMO is getting at and that you know, uh, other sources uh, uh, dispute but, but this is real-time policy evaluation, this is real-time debate, right, is whether eat out to help out was or not accountable for a surge in uh, and, and to what size of local infection clusters. And Simo is concluding that there's about an 8 to 17 percent increase of um, COVID clusters uh, by comparing regions that were had more participation uh, as measured both by official participation of restaurants and mobility um, even taking into account exogenous sources of variation as did it rain on a Monday in a, in a local area where restaurants were open, but on the eat out to help out scheme, okay? So again, this is something that I've never seen, real-time policy evaluation, both at the macro, we talked about interest rates and is the, what is the slack in the overall economy, going all the way to the micro to very kind of, um, you know, micro policies, that were put in place and, and whatever. So the other thing that also Louisa touched upon is uh, something that has been going on, but has been made cheaper and faster, which are basically global or cross-country, large-scale real-time surveys. And again, these have had a big impact on our understanding of inequality during the crisis. So I'm gonna give you two ways in which inequality has played out. There's many more. So one is we all do different, have different occupations and different tasks. And these tasks differ inherently, mostly by technological reasons, by feasibility of how much can you work from home based on the task you do. And this is already, this is essentially a large scale service coming in in March 2020 and April 2020. So again, real time, it's a little bit easy to talk. But I want you to understand that a lot of your, this is intuitive, is because this was possible to do within a month of lockdowns, right? So what you know is coming from here. And what you know is that job, prob job loss probability was highest in jobs that could not be done from home. 
And again, there, there is an, a lot of interesting data science and, and machine learning, for example, on, on creating, for example, an index of can you do on work from home, given a description, a text description of how much uh, of those tasks are able to, what are the tasks involved in a given occupation, and then infer from that uh, what is the extent to which you can work from home in that or not. So there's a classification task based on text data. Finally, uh, oh, and, and I just want to leave this on the table because it's important. Again, perhaps not surprising, but again, these large scale surveys also establish the extent of gender inequality. Uh, this is just one aspect of this. So this is go, go survey people across countries, ask them, um, suppose both parents are at home. So we are conditioning on that state. How much time does the father spend with the kid? How much time does the mother spend with the kid in childcare and homeschooling, right? And again, there are then follow-up work on, on correlating that with, with, job out, with job loss probability, with the fact that uh, there is a, a, a division by gender that led to less, less unfeasible performance being asked of, of uh, females across countries and how this led to essentially a job loss uh, that was inequality, that was unequal across gender. And the final aspect of this is, is, of course, you won't be surprised, um, a lot of real-time text analysis and text data. This is just one example out of many. This is work by Baker, Bloom, and many others. Uh, and this is basically um, analysis from newspaper text and from the Twitter global, uh, so the, the global corpus of tweets. And it's basically trying to create uh, uh, Essentially, you would recognize the sentiment analysis in the sense of creating uh, how uncertain are people feeling. And, and we have then economic insights on, on how uncertainty plays out, in particular with respect to investment. So, you know, the best way to describe this is that there's kind of a deer in the headlights moment when there is uncertainty and people stop investing, uh, and how this uh, impacts production and how this enables forecasts of how, what is the depth. Of, of decline in investment and production. We already talked about consumption, so this covers other parts of the macro economy. And that is coming uh, you know, from, from a lot of um, LDA, uh, NLP embeddings uh, on corpuses. You know, uh, for example, another interesting example of this is conference calls in large firms and then the analysis of text of those conference calls, which are available as well. For again, to pick up sentiment analysis and pick up uh, drivers of economic activity in real time. Okay, so this is what I wanted to say. Uh, I wanted to, and this is maybe something that is going to resurface in the discussion, maybe 80% of what I show was done by people that were affiliated in some way or another to the Delve group. So this was essentially a data science heavy, machine learning heavy group uh, organized by the Royal Society early on that was reporting to uh, SAGE. All right, and, and trying to give data analysis uh, across the broad and uh, across the board in an all economics uh, on, on, on kind of um, data science insights. Um, and, and one of the, of the various reports, there are reports on masks, there are reports on many other aspects, but it was a, 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 a kind of medium depth report on the economic aspects of the COVID-19 crisis in the UK, where there is discussion about data needs, data analysis, and, and, and how things can move usefully forward. Uh, if people want to know more about this kind of empirical real-time term, um, there is kind of an ESRC-funded economics observatory, which is put as, as profiled a lot of the work that has been done in real time and empirically in the UK. And in Cambridge, we also have our own uh, uh, science communication about what has been done during the crisis. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Vasco, for the very clear presentation. It was a great compliment to uh, Luisa's uh, uh, discussion. Uh, I want to kick off uh, the panel uh, segment of this event uh, with a question to Karen to bring her into the conversation. And then we have a set of very interesting questions uh, following that. Um, well, we saw from the perspective of measurement and analysis how the new data landscape posed by the pandemic has altered and in, in provided opportunities and challenges for entities like the ONS and, 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 
analysts like Vasco. Karen, from someone coming from an agency like the, the FCA, how has the pandemic affected how you use data and uh, uh, filter it to, to inform your, you know, your decisions? Yeah, th thanks very much, uh, Ario. Um, you know, uh, really appreciate the opportunity, kind of joining this conversation, and 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 thanks to Vasco and and Luisa for for uh, two really thought provoking, very very stimulating, um, insightful presentations. And uh, you know, scribbling away on on some aspects that I'll be following up uh, with uh, each of them on as well from our side. Um, I think the you know I think the step back uh, kind of you know headline on this is is that it's affected um, the uh, our use of data and analysis um, you know to quite some degree I think the um, the shock has been uh, an accelerator for some of our uh, use of data, including some alternative data, uh, more timely data, you know, timeliness. I think Louisa made the point about that. Uh, you know, I think uh, outside of a shock, you know, when you're thinking about sort of attributes and dimensions of data, um, the timeliness, you know, perhaps always is, isn't quite so in focus. And obviously, you know, what we found, um, we, we, we've always been very data heavy at the FCA, you know, use of data is a, a major, major part of our work, but we don't, we haven't always needed the same um, timeliness of data, say on the consumer side, uh, as we have needed um, through the crisis. So as the shock landed, I think, you know, one of the major priorities obviously is, is um, quickly interpreting that shock, sizing it, um, analyzing it in the context of your own uh, mission. And your legal functions. So, you know, we're we're a sector regulator. We regulate the UK's um, uh, financial markets, both retail and wholesale, and we have a specific mandate around that. So, it's very important. Uh, you know, we need to be very goal oriented um, in our use of data always, but but equally in in the time of a shock, it's not about understanding everything to do with the shock. It's about understanding the potential implications for um, protection of consumers, which is a you know a major objective of ours. Um, potential implications for competition, healthy, uh, you know, functioning of the markets, competitive functioning of the markets and potential implications there. They could be first order. If firms are failing, they could be second order to do with a shift in behaviours on the demand side of the economy. Uh, so you start to get into some interesting sort of questions there that require a very um, integrated approach social scientifically so into very much integrating the wider social sciences with with data science use of large-scale data sets in a timely way to understand for instance you know how covid uh, and the shock there is impacting behavior you know in ways that are relevant to to our legal functions you know and then obviously we um on the wholesale side, there is a whole raft of, you know, other use cases and questions that that kind of open up there where you would want timely data and to be able to kind of go after it and interrogate it um, to inform key decision points internally inside the organization as we as we address their our objectives to ensure uh, market integrity, resilience, stability of the markets, uh, working closely obviously with the Bank of England on some of that and others internationally uh, at the FSB and so on. So we, there is a whole spectrum of sort of um, uh, questions that require you, that, that demand you to be as evidence-based as possible. The challenge of doing that in, in a crisis is to get the timeliness of the data, just good enough data, it doesn't always have to be perfect, be thinking very much about the question and, uh, and what you need to integrate in terms of the social science and the data science for specific questions. Um, we, um, beyond our own mandate, obviously we, um, you know, I think we we have a very strong interest in, in supporting the public policy response more broadly and um, supporting the health of the, uh, of the economy, of society. Sometimes our data is useful in that regard. Sometimes the conjunction of, uh, of sort of data sets can be powerful. It isn't always possible immediately just to start sharing and merging data sets. But um, I think, you know, you're always looking for those opportunities. And I think there, there are various reflection points, you know, that the crisis has provided around some of that. But things, you know, to I think Vas Vasco talked about uh, re real-time surveys. We've been doing quite a lot of real-time surveying, more more during the um, more in the aftermath of the shock than we were doing, you know, a year before that. Say, uh, but then also I think for us stitching that together with some of the unique transaction data um, that we hold internally at the FCA, so regulatory returns, 
um, uh, data points on individual uh, consumers, obviously sort of, you know, sensitively handled, anonymized appropriate or de-identified appropriately to stitch together a, um, a more holistic view of, of the impact of COVID on households, on their finances, on their use of credit, on their use of different coping mechanisms so that we can figure out ultimately uh, how we can best support them through our policy response. So we we had a, a, a set of measures um, related to the, uh, you know, giving consumers the ability to defer payments on their mortgages and consumer credit products to provide them with some relief as a complement to uh, you know the various uh, temporary support measures such as furlough that have been introduced into the economy more widely so we we need to be very um, evidence-based in our approach to that making sure that we kind of you know understand as much as possible that's relevant for that as we design and sort of shape those interventions how long to leave them in the market for what off-ramping and and sort of migration to a to a different state post that looks like we, we've done quite a bit of work, if you, if you like, sort of macro to micro analysis where we take um, macro forecasts from across the economy, you know, what's going to happen with unemployment, what about unemployment by sector, we've got individual level data, including, uh, you know, in some cases on sector of employment and so on that we hold internally, can we kind of stitch that together and run forward some, play forward some scenarios. Uh, so under different scenarios for the macro economy, what might happen um, microeconomically speaking to, to a set of households or individuals that we're able to track through some of the lenses of our regulatory data and real-time survey data and how can we use that to, um, to inform the evidence-based design of support measures that we're putting into the economy from the regulatory side um, and the way that that's going to land, you know, think, trying to think through some of the heterogeneous impacts of that and the various aspects around just trying to tailor that and make sure it's the right kind of support. Wonderful. Um, so you, you now gave us the perspective of the, the regulatory agency or the policymaker and mentioned something that is quite fitting, which is the changing behavior and possibly behaviors that may remain uh, different from what they were previously, even past the, the pandemic. So I want to take this opportunity to take a few questions uh, that were posed to us by the, by the audience. By the way, I have way too many questions here. I'm sure the speakers will be able to respond to them in private, but I'll try my best. So Paula Triseri uh, asks in particular about the ONS data. Uh, from the analysis that have been done, has the ONS tackled the problem of forecasting indicators such as traffic for future changes when things reopen? And then again, you know, the, 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 the wires that connect us, the behaviors perhaps will have changed and doing the forecasting when your parameters are going to be somewhat changed is a complicated uh, task. I think in economics we refer to this as the Lucas critique. So I wonder if uh, Luisa has anything to say about that. Thank you. I think it's a really interesting question. And as you say, in this rapidly changing situation, we don't know what things will look like in a year's time. How do you find the data that's, that can predict that? What, what are the things that it depends on? But to answer the actual question about, are we looking at it? We're, we're working some of our partners. So we've worked a bit with the Economic Statistics Center of Excellence, which is our, some of our academic partners who are working on this question um, and various others. We haven't completed anything on that yet, but we're working on it. Very good, very exciting for those who are in the audience and want to work on this. Now I want to put together a couple of questions also from the audience that relate to, you know, some of the things that were touched upon. Uh, you mentioned data from Revolut, Azuna, BBVA, and so on and so forth, uh, Facebook, Google. Uh, so Sarah Bufelja, uh, I apologize if I mispronounced your name, says that Facebook and Google data, they have been indeed instrumental, but are only temporary. I plans to sustain these data for research. Uh, and beyond. And Martin Widener also uh, asks, uh, you know, various biases in real-time data. Should we take those data more as qualitative or as opposed to quantitative inputs into models or something that's more representative? So uh, these data, they, they have all sorts of selection issues. Uh, the people that transact uh, in a certain way um, through BBVA and choose that, uh, that, 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 that platform or Advent or Azuna or Revolut. Uh, and the very fact that these were agencies or platforms that chose to open their data to you guys. So how do you see this uh, perhaps from the perspective of analysts, uh, regulators uh, and uh, statistical offices? Uh, does anyone have anything to say about that? Pascal, you go first. Yeah, very briefly. So I, I think I was 
very embedded in different fronts of, of, of this thing. And I think, I, I don't have good answers, but I do think that, so I want to push back against a little bit of kind of, this was a special moment. I, I, what I, I guess the thrust of my thing is, this is going to happen in every recession. The shock, the socioeconomic shock is going to be different, but the fact is that that data is there. So now I think you can approach this in different ways. One is, a bottom-up approach, so kind of trying to understand, maybe by policy incentives, what are the incentives of private uh, actors to share that data for research? And I think that's a complicated um, question, but I think it's something that, you know, uh, private actors are moved many times by incentives, and we need to understand what those incentives are, and each private actor is different, but there could be, for example, subsidization, taxation, they are contributing to the public good. They are the owners of data and they are contributing to public good. So they, they, they should face some incentives. So they're kind of a bottom-up approach. A more top-down approach is understanding how these data feeds properly anonymized, properly can have, uh, can be integrated in places like the ONS. So to what extent, uh, you know, can we learn from the scramble that we did in this particular moment to establish, uh, maybe by regulation, uh, so this is a top-down um, kind of continuous feed. And I think going to Martin's question, that will help a lot, you know, in a sense that there was a scramble. So I think people took the data that existed, as Louisa was saying, you know, they wanted the answer for tomorrow. Um, but I do think, for example, in the universe of a bank with all the bank accounts, all, you know, if you think about all that a bank knows about you, it means that that plus machine learning plus willingness of the bank plus, plus being very careful about uh, privacy. So through aggregation, through anonymization, through synthetic data, you can de-bias. And in fact, that's what we're doing with UBVA and the Spanish uh, National Accounts Institute is trying to give essentially, you've noticed that the ONS always says the faster indicators and the national accounts. I want us to move to fast national accounts. So it's possible to do, and this is what we're doing inside BBVA, to have national account consumption being produced uh, every day in every zip code. And I think that's what we're doing. So we're going back to the control room in the in cybernetics. <laughs> Fair enough. It's essentially bringing together the work from agencies like the ONS and these, um, you know, more boutique data to get something that's a bit more representative and more timely. That's again very exciting. So um, going back to the questions from the audience, I'm going to try and again mesh together a couple of questions here. So Finn Jensen asks about efforts towards differentially privacy on data and using and sharing synthetic data. Again, it goes back to uh, things that were already discussed. And Valeria Haberland uh, also wonders, and this has to do with privacy, about issues uh, regarding privacy consent issues in data sets like the one from Facebook and telecoms location and, 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 and all the information. I presume um, some of these issues do appear for the FCA in some degree or another. Um, Perhaps, uh, I don't know, uh, Louisa, do you have anything to say about that? I do, thank you. Um, I think the first thing is to say that ONS um, has a big uh, focus on ethics and privacy. We're never interested in the operational looking at what individuals are doing. We're interested in the aggregate trends. We don't, we, not only do we not want um, individuals or individual businesses to be um, identified, that we're legally obliged to make sure that happens. Um, so all the data we've had from Facebook and Google and telecoms has all been aggregated because of course they have sensitivities. The last thing they want is to have an, an ethical issue with this. Um, so in that sense, that is covered. We've only ever had aggregate anonymized data from them. Um, in terms of differential privacy and synthetic data, I think this is a really exciting area. And um, again, we're at a really exciting time. I feel like we're, we're coming out of the urgencies to some extent of COVID with all these new things that we're kicking off. So all I can say is, oh, work in progress. Um, but looking at synthetic data and um, differential privacy, both in producing some high value data sets, 
that have suitable quality. We may never be able to make decision making on them, but we can use synthetic data for things like exploring um, models, building code, build, building pipelines, just reducing that whole length of time between thinking about something and actually running it on the data. So I think there's some real opportunities there. And hand in hand with that, there's the technical challenges of that, but also coming to a, an agreement socially about, we're very familiar with statistical disclosure control, that's been around for a long time, we're confident about it, we know what we're doing there, but can we build an equivalent thing for synthetic data sets as well? So there's the, the social and ethical side as well as the technical side of that. Very good, thank you, Louisa. We have, as far as I can tell, just about four minutes left. I'm gonna throw in a very last question and then leave the uh, speakers to respond in, 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 in private to, to the others, hopefully. So there's an interesting question here from Ian Hamilton. And I think this perhaps goes more appropriately to uh, certainly all the speakers, but Karen and Vashko possibly. During COVID, SAGE advised the government in interpreting scientific evidence. Did we need something similar for economic evidence? If not, why the difference? Uh, Karen or Vashko, very briefly, we have three and a, and a half minutes. Do you have anything to say about that? Perhaps Karen? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't speak for the for the government, you know, generally, but I can tell you for the, from the sector regulator point of view, I think we, um, it has been a collaborative effort to mobilize the evidence that we need economically, including, you know, so evidence requires data and insight and interpretation. So there you need, you know, it's not just about sort of, uh, you know, getting numbers in, getting them in a timely way. It's about bringing the economics to it. So what is your analytical framework? How do you interpret this as an economist? Um, so we work, uh, you know, we work very collaboratively with external academics, with economists based a network, you know, across the network of um, of economists, behavioral scientists, data scientists. So for us, it's very much about this sort of integrated social scientific um, perspective in much of this response and, um, and and shaping policy. So I think, you know, it, I think really, I, I guess my answer in short, just purely from the sector regulator's point of view, is that I think we see a relevant intelligence, you know, obviously some of it sitting inside our building, some of it is, ex much of it is external as you're getting into some of the newer alternative data sets, more timely data through the crisis, you need to be taking a very holistic approach. And in terms of then the, the you know, actually the very important job of just an um, analyzing, interpreting, bringing a social scientific judgment to the data, um, absolutely, you know, there can be relevant expertise and talent sitting outside you know, you're as, as strong as your teams internally may be, of course, you know, you're going to want to be integrating uh, the best intel intelligence from wherever you can get it. And I think that's, you know, that's very much something we've observed ourselves doing and, and, and wanting to do more and more of at pace through the crisis. Vashka, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I'll say, I'll do the economist. I'll say yes and no at the same time. So yes, in the sense that uh, for some reason, it was still a crisis where the health was scientific and therefore there existed a sage, but the economics was politics and therefore not a sage and therefore internal calculations uh, with, with internal collaborations to, to inform government decisions. Um, so I do think that in terms of public debate, public discourse, uh, policy evaluation, moving towards sage type uh, or even more, or hopefully more sage type kind of openness in the discussion of policy, of what policy it is looking at, what policy is interpreting at, what are the models on the table, what are the statistical models on the table. I think that would be healthy. At the same time, I don't see a need that that needs to culminate in a stage for economics per se, but uh, is kind of, I think economics itself as a profession has to react in the sense of, you know, of kind of venerable institutions like the IFS that Aureo works with at UCL, but through, you know, like the economics observatory, what in a world that becomes real time policy analysis and real time policy evaluation, how do you have uh, a public a public dissemination? And what do economists do? Economists are very comfortable usually just doing retrospective policy analysis. I'm going to look at what happened in Brazil ten years ago and tell you that I really have a smart you know, uh, insight about the policy that was they in, in, in Sao Paulo, right? And That's as right. this moves now into stuff that is relevant for the public discussion now, I think economists also have to learn uh, and not forward, necessarily yeah. inside a sage on how to kind of put that evidence forth. 
And I think we're that's wonderful. It. So, yeah. yeah, that's wonderful. I guess we're close to the end. Thanks very much for everybody. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.